For centuries, humans have been growing alongside our botanical brethren. Our histories have mixed and mingled to bring us modern medical marvels, faded folklore, and everything in between. Of course, in order to understand the plant, we have to start with its roots. I'm M. Governor Gaddis, and this is Rooted. With spring finally beginning to pop up for so many of us, this week I wanted to focus on perhaps one of the best-known spring flowers, daffodils. Daffodils, or narcissus, are known for their sunny, yellow, bell-shaped flowers with a distinctive ruffle cup-shaped center. They are bright, beautiful, and relatively easy to grow. So it's no surprise that they've grown into an iconic garden favorite. Some of the other names you might know them by are Lent Lilies, the Bell Rose, or Daffodown Dillies if you're feeling really extra. Daffodils are part of the Amaryllis family. Their famous relatives include Amaryllis, of course, snowdrops, and alliums like onion and garlic. They prefer cooler temperatures without too much intense sun and a soil that is nutrient-rich with plenty of water. It's because of these preferences that the plant can be spotted in many traditional English gardens and dotting the countryside with flashes of yellow. While they didn't originate in the U.S., they have certainly exploded in popularity over time, making them all the more prominent worldwide. While not initially naturalized in the UK, it's clear that this longtime staple isn't going anywhere. Daffodils are perennials that bloom from early spring through the very start of summer. While they may not be in bloom for long, they make their time count. As early bloomers, Daffodils get prime real estate without too much competition, and even attract early pollinators. They're a popular choice to line garden beds and fruit trees, as they add nutrients to the soil after they finish blooming, require little tending, and can even help to repel deer due to their bitter taste. Plus, who can resist those adorable little flower faces greeting you as you enter the garden? But daffodils aren't just cute. They're also extremely smart in how they've adapted. See, they figured out early on that the blistering heat and freezing winters just weren't for them. And rather than toughing them out and hoping for the best, these brilliant beauties decided they would just head south. Literally. When these guys get uncomfortable, they just send all of their nutrients down to the taproot and wait for better times. Talk about a fair weather friend. As you might have guessed, a lot of animals, and people, have figured out the whole nutrient to the root trick. It's one of the reasons we eat onions, potatoes, carrots, and other root vegetables. They have so many helpful things for us in one easy to find and calorically dense package. What's not to love? Well, daffodils, of course, have an answer for that rhetorical question. And of course, it's poison. Daffodils contain a chemical called lycerin, which is not just in the bowl, but all over the plant. When animals eat the plant, it can induce vomiting, nausea, etc. And if that wasn't bad enough, it can also have an adverse reaction when sap comes into contact with our skin. This is actually such a common phenomenon that flower pickers in the UK refer to the itchy, burny condition literally as daffodil pickers rash. While the UK might be the world's largest cultivator of daffodils, they aren't actually native there. In fact, they originated in South Europe, the Mediterranean, and northern parts of Africa like Morocco. They grow best in well-draining soil with plenty of light, and are most often found in meadows and clearings in large groups. But how did they become so popular? Well, to understand that, we'll have to dive into the fables surrounding daffodils. In ancient Greek and Roman culture, the story goes that daffodils, also known as narcissus, 
are named after a particularly self-centered man, Narcissus. Apparently, he was so taken with his own beauty that he couldn't stop looking at his reflection in the lake. One day, a nymph named Echo found herself similarly transfixed by the man and called out to him, hoping to catch his eye. However, he didn't notice her. And eventually, Echo wasted away until nothing but her voice was left. This made Venus so angry that she eventually led him to a different stream, where he fell so deeply in love with his own reflection that he stopped eating and sleeping, choosing instead to spend all of his time staring at himself. When the other gods heard of this, they got a little worried, so they decided the best course of action was to turn him into a flower, a daffodil to be exact. It's because of Narcissus that in some cultures, daffodils are said to represent unrequited or one-sided love. But that's not all they symbolize. In fact, in some cultures, it's quite the opposite, with daffodils representing luck, abundance, and new life. In fact, in some cultures, it's even believed that if you go out of your way to avoid stepping on a daffodil, it will reward you with good luck for an entire year. And in many parts of the UK, it was believed that the first person in the village to see a daffodil would have a prosperous year filled with gold and silver. You know, because daffodils can be bright white or yellow. One country in the UK with a particular fondness for daffodils is Wales, which not only made the daffodil their national flower, but also has a bit of their own history with the plant. See, Wales is actually the only region in the UK to have native daffodils, a flex they're super proud of. They're traditionally worn as an alternative to leeks for St. David's Day. And we'll get into the whole leek drama another day, but just know that St. David is the patron saint of Wales, and a lot of people opt to wear daffodils to honor him because they tend to be in bloom around St. David's Day, are a flashier addition to your outfit, and also don't make you absolutely reek of onions for your morning commute. Fashion statements aren't the only use people had for daffodils back then. Much like snowdrops from last week, we had all kinds of uses for daffodils. Most notably, daffodils were used to numb different aches and pains, using the juice from the leaves as a sort of early day benguet. But, since daffodils also contain lycerin, they were often used to induce vomiting. You know, before we found safer ways than literally poisoning ourselves. For a more comprehensive reasoning behind why daffodils can both induce vomiting and decrease pain, check out last week's episode on snowdrops, where we really dive deep into both lycerin and galanthamine to see how they impact our bodies. While we may have initially found out about galanthamine from snowdrops, daffodils are actually what we're studying to try and synthesize or at least produce enough galanthamine to make medicines using it more widely available. This is because they have longer bloom times and tend to be just a little bit less picky in terms of cultivation conditions. Unlike snowdrops, Daffodils are also being studied for their potential to help treat cancer. In fact, they're even a symbol of cancer research. Daffodil Day, celebrated March 22nd in the U.S., is a day to raise awareness and funds for ongoing cancer research. But they aren't just used as a symbol of hope for research and promotion. They themselves are a vital part of research. You see, Daffodils contain an alkaloid called hemanthamine. In a 2018 study, Belgian scientists from the University of Brussels discovered that hemanthamine actually fights back against cancer cells by preventing their ribosomes from creating new proteins, eventually leading to cell death and stopping the cancer in its tracks. It's important to note that daffodils don't just pose a threat to cancer cells, though. In fact, they do often cause humans to get very sick. This is because a lot of people tend to mix up 
their bulbs with onion bulbs. Like we've touched on, these guys contain lycerin, which cause vomiting, nausea, diarrhea, and sometimes confusion in animals who eat it. The vast majority of lycerin is found in the bulb, but the leaves, stems, and even petals contain a decent amount. That's why if you're planting or dividing bulbs, picking flowers, or even just potentially brushing up against daffodils, it's strongly advised that you wear gloves and wash your hands immediately after you finish working with them. The good news is that the side effects of ingesting lycrin only last about six hours, and most people recover fully with minimal medical interventions. Animals aren't the only ones who can get sick from daffodils, though. They can also cause a ruckus in your bouquets if you aren't careful. While daffodils add a touch of whimsy and brightness to any floral arrangement, their poisonous sap can leach into the water and poison your other flowers. It does this by essentially blocking them from taking in any more water through their stems, causing them to wilt and die much faster than normal. To avoid this, daffodils should be soaked alone for at least six hours and then should not be trimmed back after this initial soaking. While daffodils can certainly be a bit of a handful, they are still a stunning, simple, and wonderful addition to any flower bed. With so many benefits for both the garden and in research, it's easy to see why they've spread across the globe. If you liked the show, please consider subscribing and leaving us a review on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or anywhere else you listen. You can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok at Rooted.Pod. We're on YouTube at Rooted.Podcast, and check out our website, RootedPod.com, for transcripts, updates, and so much more. Thanks for being here, and until next time, be kind to yourselves, be kind to the earth, and just like a plant, drink your water.